flowing current inside the superconductor forms around a magnetic field, just like a wire when it's flowing current forms around in a magnetic field. Except this magnetic field isn't formed by electrons, it's formed by electron pairs or light. So the field it produces is not a positive field or a negative field, it's a zero field or a null field. It has no north or south pole. So the field it produces repulses north pole and it repulses the south pole. It's a null field. So as the current's going into it, or the amperage, literally the field gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. But it's a null field. And so it repulses all external magnetic fields. So whether you have a north pole or a south pole or you have voltage potential or whatever you have, it will not penetrate the sample. It won't get in the sample. It hits it and is deflected around it. If you get a high enough field, it actually feeds into the superconductor. It eats the field. If you get a high enough field, it actually pulls that energy into the superconductor and flows more light from the field. So this isn't at all like electricity. Electricity resists the field. This, if you put a field to it, it eats the field. Wow. This is really strange. So how do you get the current out of a superconductor? You have to hook the wire up to the superconductor, and then you have to resonance frequency tune the vibrating frequency of the wire to match the vibrating frequency of the superconductor, and then apply a voltage. And out come the electron pairs, and they become electrons, and now they're in the wire going on down the road. But the neat thing about this is you can put electricity in this in Seattle and run the superconductor all the way to New York City and you put the energy on in Seattle and you can wait for two months and go to New York City and take it out and it's all there. It's a quantum phenomenon that runs forever and ever and ever. You can actually approach a superconductor with a magnetic field and it starts superconducting in response to the field. It takes the magnetic field into the superconductor as electron pairs and flows light in response to the field. Well, literally, the Earth's magnetic field is a tremendous magnetic field for a superconductor. 0.56 gauss, which, gosh, that's a long ways from 2 times 10 to the minus 15th ergs. Right? That's a monster field. So literally, it begins to superconduct in response to the Earth's magnetic field. And it's flowing so much current inside of it that it levitates on the Earth's magnetic field. It cannot be weighed. It won't drop down because the Earth's magnetic field goes around it and holds it in the field. So it only floats. So in 1988, we filed U.S. and worldwide patents on ORMS. In March of 88, ORMS, and that was a refining, ORMS, orbitally rearranged monotomy elements, and S-ORMS, the mini-atom system of superconducting ORMS. So we had all these patents on ORMs, all these elements, and we had another series of patents on S-ORMs, the mini-atom system of resonance coupled atoms. And when you understand that a superconductor will not let any magnetic field in the sample, it reflects all light, what color does it have to be? White. All light's reflected, so it has to be white, or invisible. So anyway, uh, we got this filed in March of 88, and I didn't realize that any patent on superconductivity requires approval of the Department of Defense. They forgot to tell me that part. Anyway, we go rolling along nice and comfortable. You got a year's grace here from the U.S. Patent Office that if you file your patent worldwide within a year, everything's going to be rosy. So come three weeks before the end of our year, we notify them we're going to file our worldwide patent. Well, before they answered, somebody went back and reread the patent. They realized it was superconductivity. Nobody picked up on this. I said it has hoofs, it has horns, it goes moo, it gives milk, and it has baby calves, but I never call it a cow. So anyway, when they went back and read it, they said, uh-oh, off to the Department of Defense it goes. Department of Defense comes back and says, you cannot file this worldwide. It's strategic importance to this country. And we said, wait a minute, wait a minute. By law, I have to be given a six-month appeal period. You only got three weeks. By this time, Palms and Fleischmann had filed all their information on cold fusion, which if you know this, you now know what cold fusion is. And I said, no, 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 we've got to have this date. So the patent office says, okay, go ahead and file it worldwide. We'll override the Department of Defense. 
So in March of 88, we filed U.S. and worldwide patents worldwide in every country but China and the Soviet Union. Well, needless to say, my name was Mud at the Department of Defense. They said, well, if we can't prevent him from filing this patent, we're going to learn everything he knows. And so I get this phone call from this man who says, Dave, I want to invest in your technology. I said, how do you know anything about my technology? Well, he says, well, I know you're doing this, now you're doing this. And he's telling me things specifically out of my patent. And nobody's supposed to ever seen this patent. You know, the, the, the patent review board's supposed to have seen it. And the Department of Defense Review Board is supposed to have seen it, but nobody in the military should know about this. And yet this man's quoting me verbatim from my patent. So I hired a private investigator to check him out, find out who he is. Come to find out, he flies out of Langley Air Force Base. And what happened is when the military went to Congress to get approval of funds for Star Wars, Congress turned them down. And so what they did is they took a bunch of covert money and they put it over in Swiss bank accounts and this man takes that money and goes to companies who have technologies that serve the Department of Defense interest and he invests money in them. And then you have a partner at the Department of Defense. And so I said, no, no, I don't think we need your help. And he said, Dave, you will never prove this without us. You will wait two, three years before you can ever get your material on the neutron deflection studies, which are the absolute proof of superconductivity. A superconductor repulses all external magnetic fields, including the spin charge of a neutron. A neutron has no polarity, but it does have a spin charge. And a superconductor is the only thing that literally will deflect the spin charge of a neutron. So anything that's superconducting cannot be seen with neutron activation. I said, well, I already know that. I don't need that analysis. Anyway, he was back two or three times, and after that, he just dropped it and left. He never came back. We just continued along our merry way doing our research. We just continued along our merry way doing our research. In 1989, I called for my Canadian partners to come up with the money to build a plant. They had 22 other investments other than me, and all of their other investments had gone sour. And their credibility with Legal and General Assurance was being questioned by Legal and General. They said, do you really know what you're doing? And so they came to me and said, Dave, we want to tell Legal and General about the work you're doing. I said, you can't. You sign confidentiality agreements. In fact, the president of Legal and General Assurance's venture capital firm set on my board of directors meetings. His name was Peter Simon. He actually stepped there on my board, but he was in a confidentiality game. He couldn't talk about it. So what they finally did is they said, Dave, we really need to do this. How about if we all have the guy doing the evaluation agree to sign a confidentiality agreement too, and then we have the evaluation done, and then you decide whether to let it be released or not. So in 1989, Brian Lerwell, who was Precious Metal Consultant the over in England, was engaged by Legal and General Assurance to come into Canada and the U.S. and evaluate my technology. He spent 10 days. He saw everything. He saw the geological studies, the core drilling, the mapping. He saw the chemical studies and all the separations we were doing. He saw them in Canada and in Phoenix. He went to GE, saw the fuel cell studies, the record keeping, the work going on there. He went to the patent office to review the patents. He discussed with me personally everything about it. And he says, Dave, this is unbelievable. It explains everything that we don't understand in the industry. So when he got his report all written, he sent us a copy back for our review, and we took it before our board of directors. Well, Bill Estes of Estes Homes in Phoenix was actually on my board of directors. In 1989, we were in a really severe real estate slump in Arizona. And Bill Estes was kind of having some financial problems. Bill was also a small investor. And Bill said, Dave, if we release this report to a $26 billion a year mutual fund, they could put up so much money, I could not match it with the amount of money I would need to come up with. And so I'm refusing to let it be released. So Legal and General Assurance paid for one of the top men in the world to evaluate our technology in 1989. I have a copy of his written 